Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about our current division in this country, as expressed by the election yesterday. Our current division is not going away. We still need to deal with American fascism. Our co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Our esteemed guests for the show are Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar, and Manfred Heddingson, American. Emeritus Professor of Political Philosophy at UH Manoa. Welcome all of you to the show. So let me start with you, Gene, because uh, you were reading from uh, a, a little a little work you did back in 2011, um, examining the elements of fascism and um, maybe connecting it up, uh, and it's totally relevant today. Uh, can you explain that and read that for us? Well, I'll try to paraphrase. I wrote an introduction to a wonderful memoir by a member of a fascist Christian group in 1985 that was confronted by the FBI. He was an amazing guy, still is, Kerry Noble. And he turned around after uh, he helped uh, solve a confrontation and went to jail for a while and wrote this fantastic book called Tabernacle of Hate. And it was going out of print. So I got uh, a major scholar that I knew uh, to re-publish uh, it. And when he, I did that, he asked me to write the introduction. This was in 2011. And I wrote a section in the introduction on fascism because I had been studying the roots of fascism in America for a very long time. And I'm just going to say what I identified in 2011 was necessary to create the situation we see today. And that was, I'm going to read this, for a fascist movement to attain ruling status, it is necessary for the churches to stand aside. Those are the mainstream churches. A dominant center or conservative majority like MAGA to align with the fascists in order to unify the nation and a charismatic figure, Donald Trump, to ascend by votes or political acquiescence to head of state. And then in addition to that, you have to have an ideology. It's called an eschatology, an ideology of the end times, like Steve Bannon talks about. The eschatology of a white supremacist racial holy war depicted in the Turner Diaries, which of course is what uh, influenced Timothy McVeigh to bomb Oklahoma City, um, at CSA in a microcosm of what could mushroom on a national scale if the radical right were able to fulfill the dream of harnessing a what united white supremacist movement to a race-based version of Christianity in the ultimate war of good against evil. Oh my God, 2011. That's um, more than 10 years ago, isn't it? And it's, it's before Trump ever ran. So Tim, um, you know, we've, we've seen the word fascism used uh, with respect to Trump over the past few weeks. But in fact, you and I have followed his moves for, you know, what, seven or eight years now. Um, and it's not the first time some of these fascist elements have appeared. But you know, should we have been more aware of fascism as an element in American society seven or eight years ago? Did we see that? Did you see that? What are your thoughts? Well, we saw all the breadcrumbs leading to fascist leaders, autocrats like Viktor Orban or Erdogan. Uh, we don't have to go back to Hitler necessarily to, to to follow the breadcrumbs. We saw it very early on. But the second you start talking about fascism, it leads to the topic of Nazi Germany. And the second you start talking about Nazi Germany, people's eyes glaze over going, well, there they go again. Those libtard Democrats, they're always talking about fascism and the crazy Nazis. Oh, Donald Trump is no crazy fascist. Um, so you, you're discounted... You're discounted at hand immediately. And I, you're right, in the last month or so, um, that those discussions came up 
on a national level now in, in, in the attention of the national media versus people saying if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. Um, it, but it was too little too late. And I'll have to say that the education system has done a poor job of reminding our younger generations what caused World War II, what was the nature of Nazi Germany in the 30s, how did Hitler rise to power, and look what happened as a result. Uh, so we have only ourselves to blame as far as um, our federal education system, uh, the lack of teaching civics, the lack of teaching how government works and, and how the Constitution and the rule of law the rule of law works. Uh, we've arrived at this point, and now 51% of our population says, I don't care. I don't care at all. All I know is that inflation is higher than my wages have met, and that's all I care about. Or in the case of some of my dear, dear friends, hey, my 401k looks great. What's the problem? Manfred, we should make the comparison between what has happened in the US. And I mean, going back to 1934, in which there was a Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden, and then a much larger one in 1939. And there were people like Lindbergh who were friendly with Hitler, you know, for the reason that they liked what he was doing. There were a lot of people who were sympathetic to German Nazism during the 30s, and maybe you know, going forward after that. They may not have called it by the same name, but arguably the elements were there. So my question to you is, um, you know, is there a parallel here? Is there a real connection between what looks like American fascism and what was happening in Germany in the 30s? Well, I would be a, be a little bit uh, reluctant to make this identification. But I think the use of the term fascism, you know, came up after World War I. Uh, and it was, in a way, a, a term that uh, characterized ultranationalism, which it's with its uh, racist dimension. But it goes back, I mean, it's originally an Italian uh, term. And you have to remember that the three uh, powers that became fascist in the th in the 20s and 30s uh, Italy Germany and Japan they were all late nation states um, in Italy you know you have it in 1861 in 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 Japan uh, a few years later in Germany in 1871 so what you have here are three major societies that, uh, in a way, became well, became very late nation states, and this ideological uh, rhetoric that emerged in these unification processes uh, included the hate. Of the revolution of the revolutionary Western societies, the United States and France. So it was from the beginning anti-enlightenment, and it had also a, a connotation of a particular form of racism in in Germany, in Italy in Japan to some extent uh, also but i think when you are talking when you are talking about the lineage of fascism in the united states and limited to the 30s uh, copying uh, nazi germany or italy i think something has to be uh, added and you have to begin to understand that the uh, white uh, racism is part of the founding of this country. And when you read uh, Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, you know, from uh, 16, from 1786, you have there, I mean, I hate to say that, and I've written about it in that text, uh, the foundation of American racism, of white supremacy. Now, the fascinating thing about Thomas Jefferson 
is that in 1786, uh, you know, he didn't only publish this book in London, but he fell in love with Sally Hemings the 17 year old or 16 year old black slave that came with his surviving daughter to uh, to paris uh, so you have there a schizophrenic thomas jefferson on the one hand ideologically he is a racist existentially he falls in love with a black woman and you know when you're looking at the way you know americans have dealt with racism you know the constitution uh, doesn't guarantee uh, equality that comes after the Civil War of the 13th uh, Amendment. But then when you're looking at the Jim uh, Crow laws, you know, that emerge in the Reconstruction period, there you have the institutionalization, you could say the beginning of the institutionalization of American fascism. Uh, I mean, when you read when you read this new book about uh, the Klan War, in which Ulysses Grant, you know, is be uh, described as a as a president, you know, who fights this Klan, even though initially he was not really interested in dealing with uh, the freed, the four million freed slaves. But when you read that book, when you read, when you are encountered with the violence, you know, the, the bloody violence, the killings, the lynchings. Uh, the, the the riots uh, that were connected with the Klan from uh, 1867 uh, until you know almost World War One. It's absolutely stunning. Now that is really the foundation of what I would say the the, ment the bloody mentality of uh, racism. Manfred, I want to move on to Gene with one question that emerges from your comments. Uh, we were talking a moment ago, Manfred was talking a moment ago about schizophrenia and sort of call it political or social schizophrenia. And I wonder, you know, if you can have fascism, which I suppose the American type of fascism that we are talking about, and you can have democracy, can you have them both at the same time? Or is it a kind of schizophrenia? Gene, what do you think? Well, uh, I, I was listening very carefully to Manfred because in my uh, previous research years ago, I started out understanding the, um, the impact of the Southern lost cause mythology on all of American culture and Jim Crow and racism in this country, and also to look at the genesis of the Ku Klux Klan. There was one Klan right after um, the Civil War, and it kind of played out. And then in the 1920s, around the time that fascism was developing in Europe, there was a national Ku Klux Klan founded by a nephew of Bedford Smith who started the first Klan. And that Klan around 1920-23 came out right at the same time as the film, Birth of a Nation, in which you can see the genesis of American fascism and racism and glorification of the white race. So what happened during the 1930s was that there were interactions and connections between the Ku Klux Klan in the United States and Hitler. Hitler admired the Klan, and he admired what how they operated and he admired their races. You don't need to be have anti-Semitism to have fascism. Right. Um, you can have any group identified as an out group or a group that is lesser or other or to be exterminated or to be expelled. And we have that right now. We have the immigrants, not only the ones that are amassed at the border, but the ones who are productive members of our society today. J.D. Vance says there's 25 million of them. Documentation identifies 11 million. But regardless, these are people that would be first caught in the net. And we know from what happened in Germany in 1933 and forward, the first ones caught in the net, once you institute the 
treatment of those people. And we had a prodrome of that with the separation of children and parents at the border during the Trump administration and the incarceration and and uh, basically relocation of children. Um, we can expect that to happen. And we can expect that to happen soon. Robert O. Paxton, who is the great scholar of fascism and still alive today and was recently interviewed um, and identified what's happening today as fascism. Finally, he did that. He, um, he basically uh, laid out a functional definition of fascism, not identifying this trait or that trait or the other trait. He said, look at what they do. This, of course, is what Rachel Maddow says all the time, because I'm sure she's read Paxton. But he says it's rapid action through time. And what has Trump told us he's going to do? Day one, I'm going to keep my promises. Everything I promised you, I'm going to do. Watch me. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. He has already eradicated the Republican Party and replaced it with the MAGA movement. And if you heard his acceptance speech last night, he used the word movement. He always uses the word movement. It's his. He created it. He put it together. And it is his. And he did it through rallies, just as Mussolini and Hitler did. So the parallels are rampant. And I've been studying them since he came to office. And I've written about it. Tim, before I was asking um, whether you could have um, a fascist state, such as we seem to be having, or likely to have in greater degree now, and democracy. Uh, can you have them both at the same time? And and um, actually, um, both Manfred and Gene have linked um, a fascist state with racism. So I guess my question is now a little more compound. Can you have a democracy where people are supposed to be equal under the Declaration of Independence um, with a state that has racism, which is an inherent part of fascism? Can you have all three, or is that multiple schizophrenia? Well, in the pure sense, I, I would probably say no, but we don't operate in a pure world. Uh, we've been operating, as far as I'm concerned, which was cemented by the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United, we've been operating more or less as a plutocracy rather than a democracy, or certainly as a republic. Um, I, I, think, I think that's how fascism gets its arm of operation when you have a, a, a plutocracy that runs government regardless if it's Republican or Democrat. And, and how are our decisions been made? How are our decisions not being made in Congress? Well, everyone has a lobbyist, and those lobbyists are quite successful to make sure that democracy does not get fully implemented. Or if there's if there is the hint of it going to be implemented, uh, it will have severe, severe guardrails to make sure it doesn't catch on to other areas of that um, the billionaires are concerned about. Uh, so the answer is yes, they all can operate simultaneously, but um, we don't operate in a pure black and white uh, society as far as democracy, a republic, or, or, or a fascist government. Yeah, Manfred, let me, there's one more element now. Um, so we have um, democracy, we have um, American style fascism, which is related to European fascism back back when, um, and we have racism, but then we have um, oligarchs and oligopoly, if you will. And my question is, can all of them exist at the same time, or is that uh, somehow a m multiple uh, schizophrenia? I think you can, but you know, one of the ironies of using the expression fashion, fascism in the United States is that European fascism was always uh, defined by an anti-Western, meaning anti-American and anti-revolutionary French uh, dimension. The Italians and the, and the Germans, you know, felt that they would be overwhelmed by this Western political culture and they didn't want uh, your become in a way copies of that. So what you have is, you could say, United States today is in a way at its core schizophrenic because the movement is again, its identity, its own political identity. 
how it came into being, you know, as a revolutionary republic, not a democracy. The, the founders didn't want the, a democracy, they wanted a republic. Uh, so what you are confronted with here is this amazing phenomenon that uh, the American, the, the, the Trump movement, to use uh, uh, Gene's uh, term, that the Trump movement, who pretends to bring, <laughs> make America great again, belittles America. It, it destroys its identity by being what they do. So in that sense, uh, I, I, you have to really hope that the other side, the democratic side, you know, will begin to understand that they are really in charge of this American, <clears throat> of this revolutionary political uh, identity, and they have to <clears throat> be able to somehow install that through education and however else in their constituency. They have not been very good at doing that. Uh, to point out, you know, this radical difference. They are really uh, the, the, the Democrats, you know, are the heirs to the revolutionary tr identity of this society, whereas the, the others, the MAGA people, they are the, the killers, the destroyers. Yeah, I take your point. And Gene, I want to ask you this, you know, Manfred says that one of the elements of fascism as it emerged in Europe was they didn't like the they didn't like the U.S. It was a revolutionary society, as was France, um, and you know part of their program was to you know oppose uh, the revolutionary society here, I suppose, and also in France. But isn't the the fascism that we have now in the country, the MAGA fascism, even as described by Manfred, isn't that um, a, a movement that eats the country, that opposes the country, that opposes the history and the values and the principles of the country? Isn't it the same thing as opposing, as the Europeans' fascism opposed the United States? Of course, it's a fifth column. We used to use that word, but it's much bigger than a fifth column now. Uh, it's taken over the country and the three branches of government. So we are faced now with reality. And this is going to be a test of what we unfortunately expected and studied. And uh, we're going to find out how it plays out. We're going to learn a lot. It may hurt. But my take on what this movement wants listening to Vance and um, Trump in their speeches, is it wants to return America to the society where whiteness was dominant, financially, socially, and in its a, a hierarchy of authority. Positions and offices of authority need to be held by those who are loyal to the leader. The leader will fix it. The leader embodies the will of the people. In this sense, they call it a democracy. So when you say, can they coexist? Yes, but what are we talking about? There are two versions of democracy here. Xi Jinping says that he has a democracy in exactly. China. But you know, I, I'm reminded of the Ben, I, I'm reminded of the Ben Franklin story. You know, he walked out of Liberty Hall after they had all their meetings uh, and the woman stopped him. And she said, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of a government uh, will we have? Which was the point of discussion in the Liberty Hall meeting. And he said, uh, it's a republic, madam, if you can keep it. You know, there's something troubling about that. And now we find out exactly how troubling. You were going to say, Jean? Yes. Um, echoing Manfred also, who is aware of that. Um, it is not we were not a democracy because that was considered mob rule in those days. And they they were worried about the terrorist mobs. In fact, we did have American terrorism at the beginning of the revolution. The Sons of Liberty tarred and feathered people. And they're the same ones that tossed the tea overboard. And we 
extol them today, but they really started out as a terrorist movement. And David Rappaport, the great scholar of terrorism, has pointed this out. But the point is, we we have all these, we have inherited, like any society, a dark underbelly of instincts, impulses, and practices. We have evolved from the time we were a republic. We are now trying to become a real democracy that exhibits uh, a, a kind of a, a, a proportional um, balance between the voter and the deciders uh, in the three branches of government, not having this layer of representation in between like the Electoral College. You notice how the Electoral College has been targeted as the weak link that the Republicans, not just the MAGA movement, but the Republican Party, having been a minority party for 50 years, has gamed uh, in, in order to um, succeed in the system. I was going to say there's one other element, too, that is very overlooked, and that is the element of religion. Uh, spiritual irrationality is a big part of fascism, and it needs a religious center. And it's got it in this country now with Christian reconstructionism, which we should talk about some other time. So, Tim, you know, it seems clear from this conversation that fascism in this country, the elements of American fascism, did not arise with Trump. You know, a lot of people, when the term, you know, be became popular recently, um, people said, oh, yeah, that's, that's Trump's fault. It's not really Trump's fault. Um, he's capitalizing on elements that were already there, maybe for a long time. But the question is, can we get through this? Can we fix it? He's not going to fix it. I think that's clear. He's got an agenda that's just the other way. But can we ever go back to when it was more like a republic, more like a, 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 an equality of humankind, a kind of democracy, if you will. Can we go back? And how? How can we do that when you have what amounts to uh, a would-be, wannabe dictator running the place? Um, before I could answer that, I think I have to look at you know the forces that have influenced our politics for 50 plus years. And I'll go to a comment that Gene made you know, this MAGA movement isn't just about restoration of power for, for, for white, uh, white people. It's also the restoration of power for males. Yes. White males or otherwise. Yeah. Males. Um, you look at the Ronald Reagan uh, initial years, and it was the installment of the family values. That was Ronald Reagan's big kickoff was family values. And, and what is a part of family values? Uh, a patriotic uh, overview of, of life. In America, whether you're in the suburbs or in the city, it's it's a it's a paternal oversight, and that's been going on since Ronald Reagan, and now it's come to um, to Trumpism, to MAGAism, and I think that's why maybe Harris didn't get all the votes she expected from women in the suburbs, because many women in the suburbs are okay with a paternal way of looking at life, and I you know I think. To answer your question, how do we go back to those days? Well, I guess then you, you take away, you strip away the rights of women. You diminish the rights of, of gay people. You diminish the rights of minorities and equal opportunity. And you get back to father knows best uh, kind of way of governance. And, and that's unfortunate because that takes away 60 plus years of progress trying to live to the constitutional idea that we're all created equally. Um, the Constitution never guaranteed that, as we all know. And, and, and so to, to hearken back to the days of old, you know, the halcyon days of uh, what MAGA wants you to believe, or as Donald Trump says, a new golden age, that's what he said last night, uh, it really does mean going back to 1942. Or before. So, Manfred, you know, um, do you agree that if you uh, withdraw all these rights, uh, that if you make um, women subordinate, um, that if you 
allow people to be racist, uh, that's going to solve the problem. And I and I mentioned as a footnote, in Europe, uh, we, that is the global community, um, really were unsuccessful in stopping Hitler and Mussolini. Um, that fascism had so much power across the, the, the face of Europe. And the only thing that stopped it, that corrected it, was a war, a conflagration that killed tens of millions of people. And that's the way we know, by way of evidence, how you stop fascism. Do you agree? Well, look, I think <clears throat> one of the major problems that we have not talked about is that America suffers from a lack of a critical understanding of its own history. And, and we have to confront you know, all of these mortgages that linger in the American political landscape. Some of them we have mentioned, but one of the most fascinating periods for me is the period after the Civil War, when after the assassination of Lincoln, you know, you get uh, Andrew Johnson into power and he did everything in order to uh, prohibit the reconstruction project to get off the ground. I mean, when you read the 14th Amendment, there was the possibility to get uh, the rebels uh, before courts, but Congress's attempts were pre uh, prevented by the president. And when they tried to, uh, you know, in, in, to get him, uh, well, what's it called? The impeachment, it failed with one voice. But when you are reading <clears throat> the 14th to 15th amendments, I mean, there you have <clears throat> really an indication what should have happened after the Civil War, for America to become a sane society. But it didn't. You get then the KKK and the radical violence that you have there. Now, there's one thing when, when we were talking here about patriarchy. One of the major differences between the United States and Europe today is that almost all European societies have had female leaders. The United States is the only Western country that didn't have, uh, up to now, uh, uh, a female president. But interestingly enough, there are two additional uh, senators, female senators, and they are black uh, as a result of this election. So you have, at the same time, you know, this regression and progress taking place. It is now up to the anti-MAGA movement the uh, the Democrats, the critical Democrats, to rescue to rescue the U.S. Uh, polity from its self destruction. And what you mean is, we have another election in two years, and there will be some people in the Congress uh, who could be replaced, and that would yes. be the step step number one. But step number two, I think, would be really. A critical. I mean, what happened in Germany after World War II, not immediately, it took a long, long time. But what you have had then in the 70s and 80s and 90s has this uh, the Vergangenheitsbewältigung, processing of the past. And I think it was a very, very, has been a very successful process in Germany. Uh, so for that reason, this kind of processing, critical processing of the American past has to become a center issue, you know, of the three uh, construction of American, American policy. Well, let me offer, it's not going to be any easier uh, when Trump takes down the Department of Education. Oh, it's not going to be easier. No, no, you're you're right. Right. You can quote me on that. Gene, I want to ask you. I mean, the one, uh, little point, one point one we have not talked about what happened today in Germany is mm -hmm. that the, the Scholz government has come to an end. And that is an aftermath of the Trump election, I think, because uh, Scholz, you know, is confronted with the question, 
what happens if Trump becomes president and he wants to have the military budget enlarged and his co one coalition part of the liberals, it, the finance minister it, did not support that. So Scholz fired him. And that means the end of the Scholz government and you will get elections in Germany uh, early next year. And the next chancellor will be the Christian Democrat. Uh, <clears throat> and on the other hand, I think you will also have the AFD. You know, you know, Manfred, a, a couple of shows ago, you and I were in contention on the question of whether mm, the West could rely on NATO and, uh, and Ukraine could rely on NATO. Um, the continuation of NATO, the efficacy of NATO, the enforceability of Article 5 of the NATO agreement, all that. Do you want to change your testimony on that? No, because I think uh, what has happened in the United States uh, yesterday and what happened today in Germany confirms my uh, notion, you know, that uh, if there is a withdrawal of the United States from NATO, which I do not think will happen. Uh, but if there should be a lowering, you know, uh, or lessening of support, especially of the Ukraine, I think the Europeans will uh, move in. And Germany understands. And the social, I mean, it's very interesting the comments to read, you know, of uh, the some of the functionaries of uh, Scholz's party. Uh, that they are for the, uh, the the support for the military, uh, and they use the Trump, the election of Trump, uh, as an argument. So in that sense, I stand by my. Well, we'll see. I, I may ask you this question again later. You know, you do so. <laughs> Uh, Gene, you know, we're running late here, and I wonder if I could uh, start going around the table, so to speak, for uh, closing comments. And, and part of the closing comment, I, I hope you guys will cover it, um, is um, what do you think happened? Why did so many people, you know, uh, vote for Trump yesterday? Why did he win in the face of all the things that he's done and said? It seemed quite remarkable. And yet, you know, you judge a country by who they elect as leader. And if I were judging the United States, and I am judging the United States, I would have to give them very low grades because of that election. What do you think? What happened? Well, one of the major things to come out of to show us from this election is the divide between uh, rural and urban populations. And a couple of decades ago, a book came out called Harvest of Rage, which I diligently read. <laughs> and it talked about the farm crisis in the 70s and the 80s, which really jump-started a lot of the so-called later militia movements. And some of uh, the lingering patriot movements that have now morphed into the different organizations that populate the dark web and animate January 6th, Steve Bannon, and the underbelly of the Trump movement. So we've had this brewing for quite a long time. And I was going to say that what the Democrats need to do is not allow themselves to be scattered and divided and factionalized, but they need to start building the coalition that Kamala Harris wanted to build among various groups that gave her the votes disproportionately um, to Trump, such as educated white women, um, such as uh, black women who are leaders and have been leaders for generations under oppression, uh, such as the youth movement that lobbied for the selection of Tim Walls because he, uh, notably turned around on gun control and bring in the climate change concern of this young Generation Z, which is so demoralized because it can't even buy a house. Uh, so the youth movement, the educated women, the black movement, 
and black women. And then they need to unify this coalition she started right at the beginning of her short campaign. And they need to do coalition building from day one. Um, Manfred, uh, let me go to you before I go to Tim for his closing. Um, it, it strikes me that if you wanted to get these, um, call it democratic movements together, you have to have leadership. Okay, And if you have leadership, you have to have people who get up there and, and organize people, and have them collaborate, get on the media, whatnot. Aren't they in, in a mm, American fascism? Aren't they exposing themselves uh, to retribution? Aren't they exposing themselves by by leading a movement that would be against Trump's wishes? Aren't they exposing themselves to retribution by Trump? Uh, and maybe that will limit uh, the, 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 the scope of the people who would lead. Well, that may be the case, but... Uh... I think one should, I think Jean is right what she said about the reconstruction of the Democratic Party and the coalition building that has to happen. I mean, one, as I mentioned before, one issue is to overcome the misogyny, this patriarchal thinking that you have not only in white among white men, but black men, uh, Hispanics. Uh, I mean, this irrational uh, misogyny is really had played, I think, a major role in uh, Harris's defeat. If I mean, you could almost ask the question: If Biden would have run under these circumstances, would the result uh, have been better? Because he was a male candidate. I don't know how to answer that. Tim, do you know how to answer that? If Biden would have run because uh, he's a male candidate, would that have been better? If Kamala Harris um, you know, was a male candidate, would that have been better? We had polling data on Joe Biden before he exited the campaign, and we had polling data on uh, Kamala Harris, uh, and it improved. The support for Democrats improved vastly, greatly. Uh, come on, you guys. It wasn't that long ago where everyone was saying, Joe Biden is lost on the stage and he can't remember, you know, yesterday from tomorrow. Right. right. And, uh, you know, so we're we're at that junction point. And many reasons Kamala Harris lost this race. What I didn't hear her say, only in the form of um, political platitudes, is I understand your pain. I understand your economic loss. I understand your hardship because I grew up in that kind of environment too. Well, you know what? That's not a lot of solace for people who their their wages have not caught up to the inflationary prices they're forced to pay with each and every day to keep their family going. Uh, it sounds great. You look at economic indicators and say, see, we're in a lot better shape than uh, than that Donald Trump tells us we're in. We're in great shape. Well, those are economic indicators of employment and uh, retail sales and GNP. That's not putting gas in the tank and food on the table for these, to a great degree, um, non-college uh, individuals that are forced to be considered uh, grievance-filled, also looked down upon. Uh, maybe that goes to Vance's book somewhat that he wrote years ago. Uh, so again, it's the rural versus the urban, the, the, um, uneducated versus looking at Democrats as educated elitists, even though, you know, Vance is an educated elitist. Um, so it's not any one thing, but I think she lost, she lost the argument on the, the economy and, you know, James Carville said it back in there during the Clinton days and he said it not long ago. It's economy, stupid. And I think we got lost, sidetracked on um, the abortion issue, the Dodds issue. I think that was somewhat muddled also with, uh, you know, identifying the obvious things that Donald Trump said and, and, and was saying uh, and that led us to believe that he truly is a fascist. Those, those realities, and I'm not saying they're not realities, but those realities um, took away from the primary argument 
of the election, and that was immigration and the economy. An interesting article, a headline in a German newspaper saying, this election is the death of the America that we admired. We admired, I mean, I grew up with that America also, you know, in the 50s and 60s uh, in, in Germany. And that image has been become destroyed by the Trump movement. And I think it is not limited to Germany. It's, I think, uh, a global uh, resetting of people's understanding of the United States. Global effect, for sure. Yes. I just wanted to say, Manfred, uh, that I really appreciated your suggestion uh, of the Navalny book, Patriot. And I went and got it, and I looked at it. And uh, the, the, the takeaway from that book, for this moment, fascism, autocracy requires propaganda, requires lies. And he was swirling in a world of lies, and he describes it in the book. And all I can say is we all have to be very mindful. If we were careful about looking at the media before and looking for evidence to back our conclusions, we have to be more careful now because there will be propaganda. The media will be complicit in many ways. And we have to make sure that we are making using the right sources and making the right conclusions because this is going to be more prevalent than it was before. Thank you very much, Gene Rosenfeld, Manfred Henningsen. Co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Very important discussion and important things going forward. Aloha. <laughs>